Okay, here we go. Hebrews, uh, the glorious Jesus. This is lesson number six in the series, Jesus Greater Than Aaron, uh, and part two of this particular uh, lesson uh, topic. Uh, we're in chapter five, if you're following along with your Bibles, otherwise we'll be uh, putting up the scripture references on the screen. Okay, so once again, just a, a little review. Um, we know that uh, the author of the book of Hebrews is comparing Jesus to various aspects of the Jewish religion in order to encourage his readers not to abandon their newfound faith in Christ for their old faith in Judaism. Um, they had the notion that the, uh, you know, the Jewish religion was superior uh, because it boasted of the ancient priesthood of Aaron. And the, uh, the author of Hebrews uh, deals with this by showing that in Christ, his readers also have a high priest. You know, the Jews have a high priest, uh, very well documented. They were very familiar with uh, uh, what he looked like, what he did, so on and so forth, qualifications. And so the writers of Hebrews describes the high priest uh, for Christians. And so uh, he says um, uh, a couple of things about Jesus. First of all, he is a legitimate high priest and qualified to be so because like all high priests, uh, he's been appointed by God. And also um, he can relate to human weakness. Uh, he's superior to Aaron because he is already in heaven. Uh, the resurrection and the ascension has been described in uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Um, and also he comes from the order of Melchizedek and not Aaron. We talked about that in previous uh, lessons. And then thirdly, this should give all believers confidence to come to God without fear because their high priest is already in heaven on their behalf and he understands perfectly their weaknesses. And so he begins and finishes the passage with a reference to Melchizedek, uh, a kind of a mysterious figure who appears only once in the Old Testament record and uses this, the author of Hebrews uses this appearance by, by Melchizedek um, as a launching pad to rebuke them concerning their immaturity. And so this particular passage again begins in chapter five uh, in verse 11. And uh, in this particular passage, he, he gives his readers an admonishment concerning their, uh, as I said, their immaturity. Uh, he rebukes them for failing uh, in two areas. Uh, first of all, the inability to discern truth from error. And secondly, the failure to have matured into teachers. And he says that the reason for this is immaturity because by a loss of the desire to hear the word, in other words, listen with intent of obeying with all of our hearts, because of that, they've, they've, become, uh, they've become immature. So let's uh, read verse 11 as he um, uh, describes uh, uh, their uh, immaturity and his, you know, a bit of frustration with their immaturity. He says, concerning him, we have much to say concerning Melchizedek. Okay. He wants to talk to them about Melchizedek and, and how the priesthood of Christ okay, is, is, is a type, uh, is, a, is a fulfillment, if you wish, of the type of Melchizedek. Some you know, little deeper idea, biblical ideas, but he says concerning him, Melchizedek, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. I'd like to get in and go deeper with you, but I can't because you've become uh, dull, of, uh, dull of hearing. So he picks up on the theme of Melchizedek from the last section and he comments that this concept of Jesus' priesthood based on the type of Melchizedek is an important subject with a lot of implications for them, but they seem unable to grasp it because they're not hearing like they used to. Uh, they're punching the clock. They're just marking time, if you wish. So here he states the case and the reason. In the next three verses, he gives the details of their failure. So let's read verse 12. It says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. So they've received much teaching and should by this time, he, he says, they should be able to teach other people. 
Instead, however, they need again to be taught the ABCs, or the elementary principles of the faith, the oracles of God, or the faith, the teachings of the Bible. Milk and solid food, you know, he uses this as a contrast to refer to milk as you know, the ABC teachings of Christianity and, and meat being the more mature, more detailed, more complex teachings of the Christian faith. So he keeps going in verse 13, he says, for everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant, but solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. So uh, uh, he's saying that one grows in his ability to grasp the more mature matters of the faith. How, how, did you, how do you do that? Well, he says, by training yourself to choose the right way to act, and to choose this con consistently. And so what you are doing in your daily choices as a Christian help you to mature as a Christian. So this learning process begins with the proper response to the ABCs of the faith with movement towards the uh, more mature matters of the faith. In other words, if you can't obey and respond to and get into the habit of you know, doing the ABCs of the faith, there's no way that you can get to the mature material, the mature teachings of the faith. So the author here is telling them that because they're still practicing you know, the ABCs of faith, you know, they're not discerning well and they're choosing consistently uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 wrong over right, uh, truth from error. You know. If they're not able to make those kinds of decisions, they're immature and he has trouble communicating with them about more mature matters, for example, Mel Melchizedek. All right? If someone, for example, you know, uh, neglects coming to worship service on a regular basis, they come once and then they miss three times, they come another time and then they, they're gone for a month. It's very hard for that person to advance in the knowledge of God's word and consequently to mature spiritually. Why? Because he, 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 he or she hasn't yet grasp the importance of you know, uh, mastering the, the very basic things of Christianity, one of which is uh, worshiping the Lord and studying His word and meeting with the saints on a, on, a regular, um, on a regular basis. And so we go to chapter six. <clears throat> He's going to encourage them to settle once and for all the elementary teachings and their response to these and go on to more mature teachings. So in chapter six, verse one to three, he says, therefore leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of uh, faith uh, towards God, of instruction about washings and laying on of hands, and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment, and this we will do if God permits. So the teaching, here he talks about some of the basics of Christianity. Okay? So the teachings about the Christ include a lot of these basic things. Uh, who is the person of Christ, he mentions. Repentance and, and our attitude towards sin. Uh, the working and the meaning and the necessity of faith. He mentions washings, and here it's the differences between Jewish and pagan and, and Christian uh, baptism. Um, he talks about the laying on of hands, um, um, uh, resurrection and judgment. Notice, these are all important things, right? We, we teach a lot about these things, don't we? About repentance, how we should act, how we should be moral, give up vices, things like that, purify our lives, uh, the meaning of faith, uh, to be uh, faithful and to be um, uh, persevering in faith. Uh, here, washings, you know, uh, the difference, as I say, between Jewish and pagan, uh, the difference between John's baptism and Jesus' baptism, the necessity of baptism, how baptism is accomplished, and so on and so forth. The laying on of hands, resurrection, judgment, you know, when will Jesus come and when will the judgment come and what will happen at those times? Those are, all, those are all very important doctrines and we, you know, we've taught a lot about those things, but notice that the Hebrew writer says, these are the ABCs of Christianity. They're the elementary principles of the faith. They're not the deep, deep things. He's not saying they're not important. 
He's just saying, look, make up your mind about these things once and for all. You know, that uh, as far as repentance is concerned, you're going to live a life that seeks to do away with sin in your life. Don't go back on that. That Jesus is the Son of God. You know, may settle that issue once and for all. The baptism, that you've been baptized in the proper way, for the proper reasons. And so you know, settle all those things. Because these things constitute basic Christian's teachings and, and until a Christian understands and accepts and responds to these in a consistently appropriate way, there can be no further growth or teaching of more mature matters. So these Christians, the ones he's uh, talking to, are still kind of inconsistent. Uh, they weren't sure of the deity of Christ and His death and resurrection. They were still careless with sin and, and, and worldly attitudes. They weren't firm. Um, they were desiring to go back to their old faith, not firm in their, in their new faith. Um, they were not yet sure that Christ's baptism washed away all of their sins and that there was no need for additional sacrificing. This was a, uh, an especially um, a pertinent uh, thought among new Jewish Christians in that time. Has Jesus' baptism you know, taken away all of our sins? Or do we still need to go sacrifice at the temple? Today, Christians, we, we don't even think such a thought. But in those days, that, that was a thought. Uh, they weren't convinced that at the end, Christ would judge and Christ would return. And so uh, uh, they're having problems settling on these things. And the writer is saying, look, make up your minds about these things. So the author calls upon them to, as I say, make up their minds about these things so that they can go on to other matters and charges that because they are not settled on these teachings, they themselves are not teaching other people, but rather need to be taught again. And he says, you know, I'll, I'll do it if God allows. You know, if I have the opportunity and if I have the time to go back over all of these things and you know, solidify your understanding about all these things, but you know, there are other more pressing matters perhaps. So what are the more mature matters? That's naturally the, the question that arises. If these are the elementary things, the ABC things, what are the more you know, mature matters? Well, for example, building up one another in Christ. That's part of the more mature matters. You know, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're teaching other people and encouraging them to grow and to be solid in the basic. You know, that's for the more mature. Um, winning souls for Christ, that's part of the more mature stuff. You know, you're, you're, not, you're not the burden being carried by everyone else, you're the one carrying the burden. You're the one charging ahead. You're the one expanding the borders of the kingdom. Those are the more mature things in the Christian faith. And then he, he talks about, um, he talks about um, uh, 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 or rather he gives a warning against falling away in chapter six, beginning in verse uh, four. So he makes clear the reason why they must press ahead to maturity, because not to go forward means that you're falling back and, and, and to do so will be fatal. The next four verses contain one of the most severe warnings to Christians contained in the New Testament. It is evident that he is talking to Christians because of the way he, that he will refer to them in these uh, verses. He says that it is, impos it is possible rather to fall to such an extent that it becomes impossible to repent. And these verses, uh, these next verses, kind of scary because they're saying that it's possible for a Christian to fall away and not be able to come back. So uh, you, know, you have to be careful. So let's read through these and you know, analyze the, the things that he is saying here. Um, in, verse, uh, in verse four, he says, um, uh, for in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the age to come. So notice all the things that he's saying here. Okay? He talks about people that were uh, uh, enlightened. Well, who are the enlightened ones? You know, coming to Christ, knowing the gospel, responding to it, 
This is the very, uh, this is the very essence of enlightenment. John chapter 3, verse 19 to uh, 22. So he says, those people, well, who are those people? Surely only the Christians are the ones who are enlightened as to who the Son of God is. Then he says, people who have tasted the heavenly gift. In other words, experienced the relief, the joy, and the assurance of salvation. I mean, what's the heavenly gift? Well, the salvation of one's soul. The gift uh, of eternal life. Our experience of salvation causes us joy, doesn't it? We've tasted the heavenly gift. We know what it's like to feel forgiven, accepted by God, assured of eternal life. There's the, the taste of the heavenly gift. Who are the people that have tasted the heavenly gift? Well, Christians, pagans haven't tasted that. Non-believers and mockers, they've not tasted that. Then he says, those who have um, uh, par, uh, uh, those who are partakers of the Holy Spirit. When do we partake of the Holy Spirit? Well, the book of Acts in chapter two, verse 38, uh, Peter says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit right there. So we experience the comfort of the Holy Spirit in our lives in a variety of ways. Uh, through prayer, where He helps us with prayer, uh, our struggle and our victory over sin, so on and so forth. Paul talks about that in Romans 8, the very many ways that the Holy Spirit interacts with us. But here he says, those people who have been enlightened, tasted the heavenly gift, those who are partakers of the Holy Spirit. Again, he can only be talking about Christians. No, no one else partakes of the Holy Spirit other than those who are given the Holy Spirit in the waters of baptism. And then he says, fourth, those who have tasted the good word and the power of the powers of the age to come. Well, who are the ones that have tasted the good word? Well, those who have heard the word of God, responded to the word of God, seen the word of God, the living word, how it works in their lives. You know, in the first century, many Christians exercised miraculous powers powers that actually belong to the Christian age, the age to come, which would ultimately be consummated by Christ's victory. So there's no doubt as to who the author is talking about here. He's talking about Christians because only Christians have been enlightened, tasted the heavenly gift, partake in the Holy Spirit, taste the word, you know, experience the word and the power that the word brings in their lives. Okay, so let's read verse 6a, it says, and then have fallen away. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance. So the experiences that he is referring to can only be had by Christians. And he says that Christians who experience these things and then fall back are in great danger of never being renewed again. He says, impossible for them to, be, um, uh, to, uh, to repent. It's, that's why it's a scary verse. It's one thing when he says, well, the mockers and the disbelievers and the, you know, the pagans, you know, they, they won't see heaven. They, they won't inherit the kingdom of heaven. And as Christians were saying, well, yes, we understand why that is. But here he's talking about Christians who may be you know, risking losing what they have. Now you have to understand, it's important to note that the author is referring to the sin of apostasy. That's abandoning the faith. He's not referring to sins of morality, which are failures you know, in our conduct. That I uh, lie, that I uh, have impure thoughts, that I uh, you know, lash out in violence, that I am critical, that I, you know, and so on and so forth. You know, failings in moral living, failings in living up to what I want to be and so on and so forth. He's not talking about those, those kind of sins. He's talking about apostasy, falling away from the faith. Um, uh, Neil Lightfoot in his commentary says, it's one thing to yield to sin contrary to the teachings of our new life in Christ. It is quite another to abandon that new life altogether. See the difference there? All Christians sin, uh, 
all Christians have a life, you know, up and down, up and down, up and down. You know, sometimes I'm, I'm successful, I'm really in the zone spiritually, so on and so forth. Other times, boy, I'm dry spiritually, I'm making mistakes, I'm giving in, you know, up and down. That's the life of a, of a Christian. And so the author in Hebrews is not talking about that experience. He's talking about abandoning the faith. So the idea is that a person who continues to reject Christianity um, and then take it up again, and then abandon it uh, again, and then take it up again, eventually begins to trivialize the life and the faith in Christ and becomes so hard that it's beyond having any more conviction be, you know, concerning spiritual life, um, any conviction concerning faith, and thus beyond repentance. You can't repent. So you know, his warning is you, 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 you can fall away and come back, but if you continue to fall away and reject Christianity and, men, and then dabble in it and then go away and then dabble, eventually you won't be able to come back. Your heart will be so hard that you, you won't be able to find any reasons that you want to come back. In verse 6b he says, since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. So their crime, he says, is enormous. They take Christ into their hearts at conversion. They taste the joy of salvation bought by the blood of Christ. They share the spirit, they see the change in their lives, and then they tear Him back out of their hearts and put Him back on the cross to open shame. In other words, the visualization of their sin, everybody sees the sin. Those who don't believe see the believer abandoning Christ and he is giving the visual, the image that you had him in your heart, you rip him out and you put him back on the cross and everybody sees that. Because everybody sees when a Christian abandons the faith. So the idea of crucifying to themselves is that they do this to their own harm, not to Jesus' harm. This type of repeated sin hardens the heart in a serious fashion to a point where it can no longer respond to the word in order to repent. It's not that God refuses the repenting, it's the idea that the person can't repent anymore. They can't do it anymore. You know, it's like a, a scar that's been seared over and hardened and blackened. It just doesn't respond anymore. In verse seven and eight he says, for the ground that drinks the rain which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed and it ends up being burned. So the author here uses imagery to describe the fate of these individuals using, you know, uh, agricultural idea. The ground you know, that is prepared, receives rain, brings forth produce, is blessed by God. And what do you do? Well, you continue farming it. But the same ground that receives preparation and rain, and if, 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 if it, what it brings up is useless thorns and thistles, well, the, the product you know, is burned and receives a curse and the land itself is simply abandoned. You don't, you don't farm it anymore. So Christians who grow in wisdom and knowledge and maturity will be blessed by God. If they continually rebel, however, if they continually fall back, if they continually refuse to produce good spiritual fruit, well, God said they'll be punished. They'll be abandoned. Now, after a warning like this, you know, pretty tough. He's telling them, you people, you know, you're, you're, you're milk drinkers, you're not meat eaters. You ought to be teaching, but you, you still need to be fed. And then follow that kind of admonition with the warning against what happens to those who fall away. That's, that's pretty strong medicine. And so after warning them against falling away, the writer comforts his audience, or readers rather, and, and, and encourages them to hang on to the hope that they have. So this device here is a hook word that brings us to the next section, which is verse uh, nine, to, uh, nine to 12. And what does he say to them? Well, he says to them, Be you know, if all of this is true, if I've you know, accurately described 
who you are and your problem, if I have accurately also described the consequences that happen when someone falls away, then you need to kind of pay attention to what I'm saying to you. And what I'm saying to you, first of all, is be faithful. Be faithful. Verse 9, he says, But beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation, though we are speaking in this way. In other words, even though he is speaking harshly, he is convinced that they are not apostate, not yet, but they're in danger of being apostate. He believes that they are producing the fruit of salvation. You guys are okay. I'm just warning you about you know, being careful. In verse 10 he says, For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward His name, in having ministered and still ministering to the saints. So apparently the people he was writing to, these Jewish Christians, had helped Gentile believers who were persecuted in the past. And the writer comments that God also sees this and will remember it. And there'll be more details about this a little further on in, in, this, uh, in this epistle in chapter 10, verse 32 to 34. But in this particular section, he goes on in verse 11 and says, and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. So they had been uh, uh, you know, uh, diligent in good works and in love, and he encourages them to exercise the same diligence in their faith towards Christ so that their hope, and what is their hope? Well, eternal life, right? Eternal glory. So that their hope, which is based on Jesus, will be fully realized. Let's face it, if the hope that you have for eternal life is based on Jesus, well, the last thing you want to do is be unfaithful to Jesus because your, your hope is all on. So uh, their hope for salvation directly linked with their faith in Christ. So as their faith in Him dimmed, he's saying, so did their hope of salvation because one was tied to the other. They needed to keep one strong in order to maintain the other. In verse 12 he says, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So they needed to do this in order to inherit the promises, just like those who came before them required perseverance and faithfulness to receive their promises. The point he's making here is imitate those people who were not sluggish, not lazy. Look at their lives. And he'll, he'll talk about that in chapter 11, you know, called the heroes of the faith. You know. He'll really give them a pep talk in chapter 11 about the type of people that they should emulate in order to maintain their faith. So he comforts them by command, or commemorating, or excuse me, by commending the good work that they've done and he encourages them to exercise the same kind of perseverance and faithfulness to Christ. If they want to inherit the promises like the heroes of old, and like I say, we're going to talk about that in chapter 11. And right here, the, you know, right here he's kind of billboarding ahead of time. There's something coming, you know, like the heroes. Uh, you, know, you ought to imitate those who really succeeded. Well, in chapter 11, he's going to give them the names and the situations of those people who actually succeeded. But for the moment, he mentions just one of these heroes of faith, and that will be Abraham. So he, uh, he points to God's oath to Abraham. Remember, this is all about remaining faithful. Okay? So in this context of remaining faithful, he points to God's oath to Abraham. Let's read verse 13 to 15. He says, For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you. And so, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. So God promised that Abraham uh, would be blessed, that through his descendants, and he would have many descendants, all nations would be blessed. Genesis chapter 12, verse 4. Now, it took a long time for this promise to even begin to materialize. We know that if we read Genesis, right? I mean, a lifetime goes by before even some of the promises that God made to Abraham uh, take place. Abraham, you know, he wandered about, he waited a lifetime before Isaac was born. He even had to agree to sacrifice him. 
uh, sacrifice him. You know, imagine you, you wait a whole lifetime to have a son, you finally have that son and then God says, okay, now I want you to sacrifice that son. And the quote from here, right, in, in this passage here, comes from this particular time, this particular episode in Abraham and Isaac's life. You know, divine beings do not need to make oaths, but to reassure men who do, God swore by Himself as His own witness. Because why? Well, there's no greater witness, right? <laughs> God's the greatest of witnesses, the, tr the, most, the most truthful witness, the witness that can truly keep a promise, right? And so He swears by Himself in order to guarantee the promise that He made to Aaron, uh, to Abraham rather. So the promise to Abraham was only fulfilled when? Well, with the coming of Christ, thousands of years later. But Abraham received a glimpse of the development of the promise as Isaac was born, was rescued from certain death, and then ultimately was uh, uh, married. And so through faith and perseverance, Abraham saw the fulfillment of his hope and he was overjoyed. And so the writer is pointing to that. He's saying to them, look, stay faithful, persevere. It's not easy, so on and so forth. And then he points to Abraham and says, look at Abraham. Look how long it took for the promises to be fulfilled in his life. Look at all that Abraham went through um, you know, before all the promises were fulfilled in his life, but they were fulfilled. Finally, they, you know, God fulfilled his promises. Uh, to him, not only in his lifetime, but throughout the generations that these Jews could look back on, he would see that all the promises God had made to Abraham uh, concerning the land and so on and so forth, all of these things were fulfilled in the centuries following his life. Then he makes a comment about oaths in general. Okay, remember God's oath to Abraham? So now God has made an oath to you, and let's talk about that. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse uh, 16, it says, For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath, is, uh, an oath given as uh, confirmation is an end of every dispute. So that's a comment about oath in general. In general, an oath is taken by calling on a witness greater than self. You know, we swear before our parents or the state or God, in order to verify the truth or the legality of a matter. When there is a dispute or bargaining, once the oath is taken, it is a confirmation that the matter is settled. Okay, so that's just general information about an oath. In verse 17 he says, in the same way God, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of His purpose, interposed with an oath. An oath. So in this case, the promise made to Abraham by God, reaching down to all of his descendants, and Christians, of course, are the spiritual descendants of Abraham, Galatians chapter 3, verse 7, he's saying that oath is sure. And to reassure them, God used the human device of making an oath as a guarantee that the matter was closed and the promise was absolutely sure. So even though God may have made a promise thousands of years before, the fact that He accompanied His promise with an oath means that no matter how much time goes by, that promise is secure, that matter is settled. So the descendants of Abraham will be blessed. Why? Because God promised and He vowed to keep His promise. So let's keep going, verse 18. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. So their vision of salvation was you know, growing dim. And like sailors you know, trying to reach a safe harbor in the storm, they were becoming discouraged of even making it. What's the point? You know, they were saying, of being a Christian, we're being persecuted. Our Jewish families are rejecting us. The state is you know, persecuting us. We're poor, we're not, we're not accepted. You know, maybe we ought to go back to Judaism. At least they're accepted. At least they have you know, stability and so on and so forth. So the author 
you know, closes this section by saying that salvation, their hope and their harbor in Christ is a sure thing because of two things. One, God is the one who promised it and He never breaks His promises. And two, God has made an oath on the matter and it is impossible for Him to lie. To lie about what? That you will be saved. That Jesus is the Son of God that the spirit that dwells in you will be the power that will raise you from the dead when Jesus returns. All of these promises that God has made, even though they were made thousands of years ago, are solid, are true, are confirmed. Why? Because He even made an oath, not for Himself, but for us, that we would be assured of His uh, promise. So He encourages them to be faithful and thus keep their hope in full view because that hope has been promised and guaranteed by God Himself. You know, years, that, that has nothing to do with anything. The number of years does not diminish the power of God's promise. And then he talks about the relationship between hope and faith and Christ in verse 19 and 20. So in verse 19, he says, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil. So our hope is that we will be with God. That's our hope, basically, if we want to kind of shrink it all down into one sentence. He says, it is this hope that steadies our souls during times of crisis. You know, anchors, they steady ships in storms and prevents them from, being, from drifting, if you wish, when they're, when they're moored, okay? Well, this hope that Christians have is not just wishful thinking. It is sure because it's been promised and guaranteed by God Himself, already said that. Even in sickness or pain, when we can't think or pray or even confess our faith, that hope is still there. If uh, it is a hope, rather, which uh, expects the greatest of treasures, to be with God, to live forever, to have the greatest joy that one could experience. He, he talks about you know, accessing all of those blessings as entering within the veil. Okay, notice here he says, and one which enters within the veil. And so you, if you're not a Jew, you're not understanding what he's talking about here. The veil that he's talking about uh, was the veil that's in the temple. So this is an illusion, uh, you know, uh, 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 he's, he's alluding to the veil uh, that existed in the temple uh, where the Jews worshiped. And um, this veil, or rather the, the place where they worshiped the temple, the Holy of Holies, um, was divided into two compartments. One compartment where any qualified priest could enter and serve at any time. And then another part called the Holy of Holies was separated by a veil and could only be entered once per year uh, by the high priest and only at a particular time. That was on the Day of Atonement and he would, you know, he would go in and make sacrifice. Now as far as the Jews were concerned, it was the place where God dwelt and all of the symbolism of the uh, architecture in the temple reinforced the concept that men could not enter and be with God. In other words, there was limited access and only by a chosen and highly qualified few. Okay? You know, uh, just an aside, the Levites, for example, who carried the articles you know, of the tabernacle in the desert, they were not even allowed to look at the utensils and the candlesticks and the items of the Holy of Holies under pain of death. They carried them, you know, but they weren't allowed to, to look at them. And so the whole idea of the temple, the, as I say, the architecture of the temple was to show that there was separateness. The, the, the Gentiles were in the Gentile court, the Jews were in the Jews court, and then the men were in one court, the women were in the other court. The priests could work in the holy place and do their things, but in the Holy of Holies, where God was only one man, the high priest, once a year, the Day of Atonement could go in to be with God, so to speak. And so the substance of the hope was that one day all men could have free access to God at any time. And this represented and compared to the idea of entering beyond the veil into the Holy of Holies. In other words, the, uh, the, the, the writer is saying, 
you know, with Christianity, not just the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies, everybody gets to go into the Holy of Holies. See what I'm saying? And so the idea of hope has been personified as entering the inner sanctuary and actually being with God. This is the hope of the Christian, explained to a Jewish mind using Jewish religious ideas and, 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 and symbols. Okay? He's saying, hang on to Christianity, because with Judaism, the priest went into the Holy of Holies to be with God, so to speak, once a year in a very, uh, a very controlled situation. With Christianity, everybody gets to go in. Everybody goes in beyond the veil. Verse 20, he says, where Jesus has entered, remember now, what is he talking about? Where Jesus has entered, you know, that Holy of Holy place, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So he answers the question, why? Why should they have hope? It is the climax for this section and it's the bridge or the hook, if you wish, for the next section. The reason this hope is possible is that Jesus, the high priest, like Melchizedek, there's the hook, which he will go on to explain in the next chapter. So he kind of, you know, the hook is he puts it in there now and he's going, to explain, he's going to explain it later. So he's saying the reason this hope is possible is that Jesus, the high priest, like Melchizedek, which he will go on to explain, has entered the Holy of Holies, and here's the important part, as a forerunner, a forerunner, it answers the question, why do we have hope to enter into the presence of God? Because our high priest has gone into the Holy of Holies, not to work only for us, but to be the first one among many. The for, a forerunner is the guy who blazes the trail into, right? A scout, if you wish. Well, Jesus, this, this writer is saying, Jesus has gone into the Holy of Holies, if you wish, as a forerunner to prepare for us to go in after Him. Now, the Jewish high priest was a representative of the people in the Holy of Holies because people themselves could not enter in. They were unclean. They were sinners. Jesus, however, is a forerunner. He goes not only to represent but to prepare the way so that all of his followers can go in. This is a function that a human high priest did not and could not have. So people can have hope because God has promised them that they will be blessed. And he's confirmed this promise with an oath and he sent Jesus as a forerunner to guarantee their place with Him in heaven. You know, it's like uh, you go to the movies, you go to a big show or something, and somebody's got, uh, you know, uh, you have to stop somewhere, and they say, well, I'll go ahead and I'll grab some seats for us, and I'll hold these seats, and then you can, well, that's, this, is what, this is what He's saying. Jesus has gone into the place where God is, and He's holding a place for us, and we, we, will, we will go there. And, and God has promised us that we will be able to go there. And He's given an oath to confirm that promise. So this hope is always in view. We always know that this hope is in view and it gives us joy and it gives peace to our soul. So long as faith remains in Christ, this hope is sure. But when faith begins to fade, so does this promise begin to fade. Okay? That's the condition. And so <clears throat> let's kind of summarize what we've done. The author encourages them by confirming that he does um, um, uh, warn them, if one, he does uh, realize that they are not apostate. And they have been faithful in the past. And he reminds them to imitate the heroes of faith in the past as they remain faithful to Christ. And he uses the role models who persevered, you know, like Abraham, if you wish, as, as an example of faith. And as I mentioned before, he's going to use more role models in the chapters to come. So, so one, of the idea is, one of the ideas is remain faithful and use Abraham as a role model for faith. Number two, he reviews with them the idea of oaths and how God has confirmed His promise to ultimately save them with an oath. 
there's nothing as sure as God's promise, but just to reassure us even more, God has also taken an oath that He will do what He's promised to do. And then thirdly, He assures them that their faith in Jesus will ultimately result in their hope of salvation being realized, and He explains why this is so. Their high priest, it is so because their high priest is already in heaven preparing a place for us. Isn't that what Jesus said? I go, to, I go to prepare a place for you. I'm going to the big show. I'm going to hold a couple of seats for you. It's the same, same idea. So these people here that we're reading about were losing hope. They were losing enthusiasm. They were losing their vision of heaven, which was their source of joy and motivation not because of trials or lack of intelligence, but because their faith in Jesus was weakening. Okay? Faith and hope are linked. Without hope, we have no joy, no desire to grow, no enthusiasm for service, no peace, no satisfaction, uh, no salvation. Without faith in Jesus. So as our faith diminishes, so does our hope. And it's like a vicious cycle. As our, as our hope diminishes, well, you know, our faith becomes weaker because our hope is weak. And because our faith is, gets weaker and weaker, so does our hope. It's a, it's, a, it's, a terrible, you know, it's a terrible cycle. So these people were losing hope because their faith was growing very weak. And the reason for their loss of faith was that they were becoming dull of hearing. That was the, the, it wasn't because they were being persecuted, it's because they were getting dull of hearing. They weren't listening. They weren't paying attention. They weren't learning. So the lesson for us is that if we don't hear the words of Christ often, we can't build our faith. Isn't that what Jesus says, Romans 10, 17? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the words of Christ. You know, how do I grow my faith? Well, by hearing God's word, by reading God's word, by interacting with, uh, with God's word. If our faith is weak, then our hope is dim. If our hope is dim, we cannot experience the joy and peace and anticipation of the heavenly reward that God has promised and guaranteed us with an oath. This is why the church is many times you know, immature and weak. We don't see the hope because our faith is not strong. You got to have strong faith to be able to see the hope. So based on this passage, remember two things, okay? Number one, Every time you wonder if you should come and hear God's word or not, ask yourself, do I want to build my faith or do I want to diminish my faith? Do I want my hope to increase or decrease? You know, answer that question. And number two, remember that the promise of heaven is sure. Why? Because it is guaranteed by God's word. Christ has gone ahead to prepare a place for us, not just any room or uh, you know, in the outside courtyard like the, the Jews in the temple and the Gentiles, but inside the holies of holies where God dwells. This is the whole idea that the author is making here. We have a privileged position waiting for us and that will be the place for those who do not lose their hope now. Uh, that's the end of our lesson. A very, you know, a very strong exhortation and encouragement to remain faithful and also some teaching about you know, the relationship between faith and hope, that you, you keep faith strong by you know, being immersed in the word and the result of that is that it strengthens your hope. And when your hope is strong, then it gives way to joy and peace and, and, and anticipation of, of the good things to come and so on and so forth. And, and when we have that joy and so on and so forth, that moves us to service and sacrifice in the name of Christ and, 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 and doing those things builds our faith, you see. So all of these things are connected, but it all begins with being involved, knowing, interacting with, learning, God's word and growing in the knowledge of His word. Okay, that's our lesson for this time. We'll move on with this wonderful book uh, in, the, in the next lesson.